Hi, my name is Marco Folia, and in this tutorial series, I'm going to be speaking to you guys about quadruped animation, specifically walk cycles. Now, if you're not comfortable with quadrupeds or you're just generally new to animation, um, it can seem a little daunting. Their motion seems to be a little complex, and it's not really as intuitive as observing a human being. So I'll try to demystify it in two ways for you. Um, one is I'm focusing only on the major landmarks, the moments that are important to make your walk cycle feel believable and weighty. Uh, beyond that, there's a lot of variety in the animal kingdom. So you'll need to sort of embellish and, and add little details yourself from your own artistic observations. Um, it will serve though as a very strong base to have a good solid walk cycle uh, moving forward. The second way is we'll treat the series a little more granularly. Uh, we'll have little videos um, focusing only on the hips, focusing only on the hind legs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this way you can get your information in bite-sized little chunks. Let's get into it. All right, let's start with a quick introduction on skeletons. Um, like I said, I'm not a biologist, I'm an animator, and so this is just a brief overview of some of the more major points we need to worry about for skeletons. Um, nothing too crazy, uh, but there are some implications for animation that are worth mentioning, uh, more especially for rigging. Um, so here we get into it. Uh, this is a kind of an example of a human and a dog. And with most mammals, you'll find that we basically all follow the same blueprint. There's just differences in proportion, and sometimes there's fusing of bones together. We'll have two ulnas. Uh, some other animals will only have one. Also, some parts of the spine can sometimes be fused. But in general, we're essentially following the same um, uh, blueprint. One of the bigger implications from the skeletal differences is the foot types. So there are three types of foots. There are plantigrade, didigigrade, and angulagrade. Plantigrades are most commonly squirrels and humans and other animals like that. Uh, didigigrades are dogs, cats, and any animal based around that. And angulagrades are hooved animals, deers, giraffes, uh, gazelles. Um, you can sort of think of them as throughout evolution, they basically have gotten more and more on their tippy toes. Plantigrades, their heel is on the ground, their toes are on the ground, and they kind of keep all their weight on all of it. Um, when you kind of get to the digigrade, it's as if they lifted their heel up off the ground. And really, they're sitting on the front of their toes. Uh, going one step further to Angula grade, it's as if they went really extreme. The metas got really long, and they're literally standing on their tippy toes. That's kind of a good way to think about it. Now, animation implications aren't super huge. There are some subtleties with foot splay and foot roll, uh, but those are easily observable. What we focus on in this series is the overall landmarks, the most important moments for weight and believability, and the rest you can observe on your own uh, in general. There aren't really any hard and fast rules uh, for the rest of it. Uh, once again, moving on, we'll kind of look at all the different types of skeletons as a quick comparison, right? We'll say uh, squirrel, dog, giraffe, and human. Like I said, mammals are basically the same blueprint with a lot of proportion changes, and that's kind of what I want to point out with this. At the bottom, we'll have the phalanges. This is just a fancy word for fingers. Um, you can tell that for dogs, cats, and other digigrades, excuse me, um, what looks like the foot from the outside silhouette is actually just the toes. And what we would normally consider our foot, which includes our heel, is actually other parts of the leg. For angulagrades or hooved animals, it's literally the tippy toes makes up the whole hoof which is pretty straightforward to see. Humans' fingers are where you expect. Moving up one are the metas. This is that little section that connects your wrist to your fingers. We have multiple individual metas that allow us to kind of uh, move our fingers around and articulate in an interesting way. Um, for dogs, that and dogs and cats, that's the section here, which is where the wrist will break um, while in locomotion. It's what I will refer to as the hawk, H-O-C-K. Um, there is another word for the back part of it, but for simplicity, I'm going to call all that section the hawk on all quadrupeds. You can look that up in a biology book if you want to figure out the real names. Um, for a dog, it's kind of, and cats, it's kind of in the section between the wrist and the feet, and it looks like the, a little bit of a forearm uh, while it's moving. For angulagrades, it gets very pronounced, and it literally looks like the forearm, the bottom part of the leg when really it's just the connection between the toes and the wrist. And humans, we have the metas, as I explained. Moving on to the carpals, which is our actual wrist. Here, the squirrel and the human are in kind of logical places. The dog, you can tell where it is. For angulagrades, it's again, more pronounced. It actually looks like the knee of the, of the leg. 
And of course, this is the front legs. The back legs have a different design, and we'll get into that in another section. Um, but that is a little confusing for people to think that the knee is actually the wrist. Uh, but basically, this whole section here is just a longer version of this. That's a good way to think about it. Because um, at the end of the day, when they're articulating, they will bend back this way from here, both of these guys. Moving on one step, again, is the ulna, which is really our forearm split into two bones to allow us to have rotation. Um, for the same thing for the squirrel. For the dog in the angulograde, though, for the digigrade in the angulograde, excuse me, it turns into what looks like the upper arm, sort of, especially for angulograde. It's very confusing to kind of get that sorted out without knowing about it first. Going up one more step to the humerus, which is our actual upper arm, this is where it starts to get very buried in quadrupeds. It's sort of under skin and muscle and sometimes fur, so it's not very easy to see that articulation. Very much like it's very easy to see it on a human being, right? Um, this is why I point this out, because sometimes rig pivots might not be in the right place. Not as common anymore these days, but certainly it was much more common in the past. Um, also, the articulation is a little bit tough to understand under all that kind of movement. That's why I want to point it out. Um, the last and most prominent feature in our leg for weight especially is the scapula. Um, the biggest difference between human beings and quadrupeds is our scapulas are on the back kind of quarter of our, of our rib cage, whereas for quadrupeds, it's on the side. Um, this has a lot of benefits, uh, which I'll go into in the other section, but it's important to notice that. One thing I would want to point out about the scapulas is while they're articulating, for some animals, the scapulas will break the silhouette. Um, and so you'll see it popping up. This is really obvious in cats and, and big kind of cats and lions. Um, and sometimes it's a little tough for new newcomers to understand that movement because there's a thing here. See this bone structure on the back of these quadrupeds? They're called the withers. These are the bones that the neck muscles connect to. But what it does is it causes a natural bump on the back of the animal's silhouette. This has to be modeled there. Sometimes it's not skinned in a perfectly good way, but all this needs to be considered for a very good quadruped rig. Anyhow, the point is that bump is always there. So sometimes seeing the scapula break that really depends on the angle of the footage. It might not be super clear. So just to be aware that there's always a natural bump, so you know not to look at that and try to see the scapula um, articulation in its own way. Um, last but not least is the neck, like I pointed out earlier. There's actually the same number of bones in every one of these animals. Doesn't matter how long the neck is. Kind of just another thing that reinforces my whole blueprint idea, which I think is cool. Um, lastly, moving on, there's a big difference and it's worth pointing out. This is not super important for animation, um, but it could be helpful in some situations. There's a big difference between herbivores and carnivores. Um, here we have a couple of carnivore skulls. This looks like a cat and a wolf. And here we have some herbivore skulls. This is like a cow and I don't really know if it's a moose or something, I doubt it. Um, somebody will point it out. Um, there are one major difference and the most important one to kind of really easily distinguish between a herbivore and a carnivore is the alignment of the jaw and the teeth. So carnivores will have the pivots of their jaws roughly lined up with the teeth some more than others. This is because they need a lot of biting, tearing action, pulling, and it gives them a lot more power to have everything lined up um, because they really only eat meat. Herbivores have the pivot much higher than the teeth. Humans at some point in our evolution were herbivores because our jaw pivot is much higher than lining up with our teeth. This allows for some other ranges of motion, more grinding motions, because again, we or they tend to eat more vegetables, which require more mastication before you can ingest it. Um, this also leads to another uh, pretty big difference is the structure of their bodies. So a biologist told us once that um, meat kind of passes through your system very quickly. It doesn't require a lot of digestion. And so a lot of carnivores have a lot less internal structure. They don't have a lot of guts to digest that. They don't need it. And so they tend to be slimmer and thinner from the, from the front view. Um, whereas herbivores need a lot more intestines to digest. You know, we've heard about the cows with their multiple stomachs. This causes all herbivores to be very barrel chested. And again, humans are also barrel chested compared to other carnivores. Um, but cows, giraffes, elephants, they're all barrel chested because they hold a lot of guts. Now the animation implication for this is that the spines in herbivores tend to be a lot more rigid 
than the spines in, carn in uh, carnivores. The reason is not only are they holding up more weight, and in fact, to support that, sometimes like horses, these kind of bones around the hip actually are fused into one piece to help support more weight, to help the muscles work a little better. Um, and so this lack of flexibility, this stiffness, comes into play more for jumps and run cycles. Um, it's not as evident in walks, but it is evident. Um, sometimes it comes down to a skinning issue in your rigs. That's probably pretty important. And so you'll notice that sometimes you're trying to match a reference or get inspired by a reference, and you're not really nailing the feeling on the herbivore. Sometimes the reason is the rigging. There's no magic solution to how to fix this. You have to just be conscious of the fact that their spines tend to be less stiff, uh, sorry, less flexible. It also means that in things like runs and other kinds of actions, animals can sometimes go from a C shape to an S shape back. This becomes less apparent, less pronounced in an herbivore. It's still there. There's still a sense of rounding and straightening and rounding and straightening, but it is less extreme. This also lends to the inflexibility of it. Just a little note to kind of notice. Um, and that's it. We'll move on to the next video. In this video, we're going to look at walks in a very general way to sort of get us started. Here I'm comparing a lion with a cow. Uh, these are very different animals, different sizes, different foot type. Um, but what you'll notice throughout this series is that the rules that apply to one pretty much apply to every other quadruped. It's more about understanding the subtlety with your own artistic eye uh, per animal. You know, that's why I really am a heavy believer in reference, at least when you're starting. And then eventually, if you get very comfortable, you can start imagining um, animations. But in general, especially with quadrupeds, I tend to always rely on reference in some way. Uh, if not for small details, at least for the overall idea, especially when it gets into more complicated movements. But looking at this briefly, um, at first, it could be a little daunting for people to sort of understand the, the style of the walk. I like to think of quadrupeds as walking with their left feet and their right feet, very much like humans do. So you will see that at any moment, I'll kind of pause it on the line here. He'll have, she'll have her right legs planted while her left legs are crossing. Then they'll plant and then her right legs will pick up again and then they'll cross. So if you kind of watch it again, you see that they're left, right, left, right. It's very similar to this very simple animation I did. That's the basic idea of how they walk, which makes sense. It gets a little more complicated because there's an offset between the back foot and the front foot. And so what happens is the back foot will tend to lift first. And right when it's about its passing pose-ish, uh, the front leg picks up. Then the back leg will land, and then the front leg will land. And so it goes from this kind of pattern of left, right, left, right, to a little more complicated because the back leg will pick up first and, the right, and, and then the front leg will pick up second. Um, but watching it again, you'll see still left, right, left, right, with just a subtle offset between the back and the front legs. This is to me the easiest way to think about quadrupeds to start demystifying it a little bit. Um, now we're going to move on into the other sections. Here we're going to go over the first major landmark of quadruped animation, which is the spine. Now, what I mentioned in an earlier video was that the back leg will pick up first. And then about halfway through, the front leg will pick up, then the back leg will land, and the front leg will, will plant after. The implication of this is something that's pretty common in animation, if you already know how to animate humans, is that the contact poses and the passing poses will be at different phases between the back and the front of the animal. So what do I mean by that? When the back legs, we'll kind of go here, let's say, when the back legs are at their passing pose, the front legs will be somewhere in about their contact pose. It's never perfect, right? Every animal has a bit of a subtle difference and there's some timing offsets. But as a general rule, when the back legs are in their passing pose, the front legs will be in their contact pose. And when the back legs are in the contact pose, the front legs will be in their passing pose. So like I mentioned, if you know human animation, you know that the height of our hips in Y, the Y translation, pardon for my, my poor drawings, um, the height of the hips will be almost at their lowest during the contact and almost at their highest Y point during the passing. And so the first major landmark is that there is an offset in Y animation between the hips and the chest. This sort of undulating up and down that's offset and not happening at the same time is apparent in every animal. As an example of, of um, herbivore stiffness, here you can see it's not as noticeable in the, in the cow as it is in the, in the lion. 
but it is there. If you scrub through this, you'll notice the up and down offset. No matter how subtle it is in your reference, it's really important that you include this feature in your animation. If not, it'll look off and the spine will be stiff, but not in the correct way. It'll be too stiff. So you really want to include this offset. Here's a better example with a line. So you kind of get a visual sense. This is rough tracking of the, of the points. Obviously, none of this is perfect, but it still gives you this idea that the line and the bum are offset. The other thing that happens in all quadrupeds is the second point, and I think it's pretty noticeable in this video, is the amplitude of the Y animation is a lot bigger in the hips than it is in the chest. So in general, well, a lot bigger, noticeably bigger. It doesn't have to be, maybe it's 10, 15% more, but the hips will go up and down a little bit more than the chest. So those are the two features, offset in the timing of the peaks for when they reach their, their, their top Y or the bottom Y, and the hips tend to translate up and down a little bit more than the chest. That covers the spine, we'll move on to the next section. In this video, we're gonna to start to talk about the details of the hips. Um, hip animation is pretty straightforward for quadrupeds, especially once again, if you're comfortable animating human beings. Um, here's a x-ray of a dog walking along. And one of the first things you'll notice is that our legs are jointed. They're connected to the hips with bones, very much like humans, they fit into a socket. And so the first implication is that when you wanna animate the hips, you need to animate it one-to-one -one with the legs as you would a person. So that means is when the left leg is forward, it's twisting towards it, um, it drops, it takes, a, takes the weight with a hip pop, and then there's a little subtlety with this axis as well. But the point is you need to animate all three axes, um, and it's important not to forget that. People that under-animate their hips, um, and I don't mean an amplitude, sometimes they over-animate the range of motion, but uh, I mean more that people forget an axis. If you do that, you'll run into problems sometimes with posing because your legs might not reach as far as you want, uh, but also it'll be lacking a lot of weight. It won't have the proper impacts, the proper kind of compressions. So it's important that you animate all three axes of your hips. This is a sort of very rough overlay here to show you the general movement of the hips. Um, and so, like I said, when the leg goes forward in the generally Y axis, it'll twist towards that leg. Then as this takes the weight and this leg goes forward, the right leg, it'll start twisting towards that leg. That's the first axis. Um, the other one that's pretty common for human beings is the hip pop, I call it, right? Um, the, the leading leg, the leg that's about to land, the hips tilt down towards it, then they pop up a little bit to take the weight. This is an exaggerated view here, just to give you the sense of it. Again, very much like humans, twist left and right, and then pop the weight on each side. And the amount of popping is very subtle for some animals. Um, it's also sort of harder to see if the animal has a lot of fur, a lot of fat, but it's almost always there. So even as an animator, I'll go in and I'll just, I'll, I'll add a little bit, even if I don't really feel it in my reference, it's totally worth having it. It's very helpful with the weight. Um, the last axis to animate is this profile one, which is very important. If we think of a human or, you know, if I tried to draw a person here, our bum is on the back, right? Our gluteus maximus. For them, it's on the top. And so this, this type of movement is in a human being's walk, but it's very subtle and it's not really apparent outside of the silhouette, right? The skeleton's doing it, but you can't really tell too much. For a lot of quadrupeds, you really can. Um, and what I'm talking about is this relationship between this pivot and this pivot. You'll see the tail lifting on every step. I'll just let the video play a little bit. This is really important for the weight. This feature, I feel, is what most animators forget. Um, and it also really takes away a lot of the, the compression, the feeling of, of it taking the weight on the leg and lifting. And so you could tell that the general rule would be that when the leg's in passing, it's either lifted or in neutral, let's call it neutral, it's default pose. It'll tilt down as the leg's about to land. Once the leg takes the weight, it tilts back up. That's the most important feature. Leg takes the weight, this lifts up, the tail lifts. And it's really important that I explain to you how to understand this, especially if you're a newcomer. Um, sometimes people will confuse this with the actual why, the lifting of the hips. And you really shouldn't um, because they're not the same thing. The, the hips are lifting at their own rate and their own spacing uh, and dropping. Um, this rotation is happening at its own timing and its own spacing. So it's important to separate the two and just treat them individually. My trick is when I want to understand the up and down, the Y translation of uh, hip animation, I'll always look at this hard spot about here. It doesn't matter the animal. There's always a hard spot here where the, the bones get close to the skin. 
and it doesn't really flex much. It doesn't really deform much. This is a very good spot, to, and, and sometimes even the bottom, the bottom of the belly here. These two are good landmarks for understanding when you're looking at your reference, the rate at which the hips are lifting, when they're slowing down, dropping again, changing direction. That's the first one. To understand this tilting, I look at the relationship between that point and the tail. So as the tail lifts to get as tall as, you know, to reach the same height, or as it drops away, that that will increase and decrease. And that's the best way for me to understand it. You might find your own way, but that's the general thing. Don't confuse the Y translation up and down with this rotation. They're totally separate things, but this rotation is very important for the weight. In this video, we're going to briefly go over the hind legs of quadrupeds. Um, the first thing you'll notice about them is that they have this cool little zigzag shape. Very different from the front legs and different from our legs, obviously. Um, these are super well adapted to being quadruped uh, for quadruped locomotion. Um, the hind legs are socketed into the joint, which gives them good support. And so the muscles wrapped around them are strong and, and can be a little heavier. And this gives them a lot of power. They are what we consider the drive of the animal. Um, the front legs also help drive, like as in the locomotive sort of pushing, but um, they're more meant for steering and grabbing and doing other stuff. Really the power we consider in most cases, the hind legs are, are the driving force. Um, in a walk cycle, it's a little more spread out, um, so it won't come into play too much into these videos, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, the first big implication for animation is this tendon that sort of helps to keep the upper part of the leg and the lower part of the leg aligned. So if we watch any kind of, this is a trot, it's not really a walk, but in general, you'll see that at every frame of its motion, those legs are lined up, right? And if we go even back to our earlier example, you know, you can pick any frame you want, basically, we'll start here. And in general, especially for walk cycles, they're generally lined up. It's not, the skeletons themselves aren't super lined up perfectly, and, but above the skin, it tends to feel that way. And it's really important to remember this because in CG rigs, especially with IK, this doesn't happen naturally. In fact, most rigs will have a control for the hawk in some way. Sometimes they'll have a control for the top and the bottom to sort of adjust that. And a lot of animators forget to do this and they just don't really fix their in-betweens and it leads to some kind of awkward looking poses. Um, it's a little more forgiving with non-realistic characters like uh, fantasy creatures and stuff like that because they are a little more abstract and maybe not um, something that we're used to seeing you could get a little away with it not being perfectly aligned but in real animals especially you definitely don't want to forget this doesn't matter the animal they'll always feel pretty aligned throughout all the movement um, very important tip for walk cycles uh, the next one is a pretty big landmark for weight and 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 sort of a sense of taking the weight uh, correctly it's the compression so when I watch this guy, the moment that matters on every step, and we're talking about the back legs now, there's always going to be the moment where it lands. When the foot lands, two things have to happen. The hips need to keep sinking for just a little bit to take the weight. In real time, at 24, 30 frames a second, it's usually about two frames. So the foot will plant, the hips will keep sinking for a couple of frames before they lift. I see a lot of animators do this incorrectly it's definitely worth not messing this up. This will really hurt your weight if you start lifting too soon. While the, lips are, uh, while the hips are sinking, excuse me, the hock will compress down. You sort of see this action here. It's a quick little hit. We'll play it. Took, took, took. Those two in co uh, combined together, the hips dropping, the hock compressing, that really helps with the weight. When you then combine it with the hip hop and this axis lifting, you really get a sense of the animal's leg taking the weight, transferring it over. These are really necessary landmarks to help with the weight. So once again, both upper and lower legs should try to stay parallel in general. It doesn't have to be perfect, but pretty close. You definitely want to avoid extreme cases where the upper thigh is pointing down and the back leg feels very flat. That's going to look really weird, period. Uh, the exceptions being some run cycles, jumping actions, certain things climbing, but we'll get into that in another series maybe. Um, the other big landmark is this moment. Hip compression, hot compression. You don't want to forget that. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Let's go over some tips for chest animation. Here's an x-ray of a dog walking. The first thing you might notice, and I'll show you a CG version in a second, 
is how little the, the chest and spine are really contributing to the movement of the front legs. Here's a rough CG version, sort of um, to simulate what you saw in the x-ray. What you're looking at here, by the way, is this is the scapula. That's the upper leg. Obviously, this is the spine and the ribs. It's a very low res model, but it's fine. Um, and like I said, a lot of the movement will come from the legs. And unlike the hips, which are rotating one to one, um, the chest doesn't do a lot of rotation. It doesn't do a lot to help. Now in the x-ray, you'll see there's obviously movement in the ribs because everything's connected by muscle, uh, muscle and sinew and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really the scapula and the arms that do a lot of the work with the walking. Uh, the reason is that the scapula is very different on a quadruped than it is on a human being. Whereas we're connected by a collarbone and other type of material here, they're physically connected, our arms, to our bodies. For quadrupeds, it's not. They're just suspended between muscle and, and certain kind of tendons and stuff like this. Which means if you were to cut here, those legs would just fall off, which you can't do for a human. You need to cut through bone to do that. Now, this allows for a lot of benefits for quadrupeds. An amazing suspension. They can, they can take a lot of weight on those. They can have a bigger range of motion for longer strides. Again, for a big compression when they're landing from jumps, let's say. Um, it has a lot of benefits. And for animation, it has a couple of simple implications for the uh, chest animation. The first one is that the chest, I would be very conservative with the rotations you put in the chest. So I especially mean this one, this dipping forward. Um, the reason I tend to really stay very conservative or stay completely away from that is because in general, in most rigs, my neck and head will inherit a motion from this rotation that I think is really hard to clean up in some cases. It just becomes cumbersome for nothing. Second, um, it doesn't really add a lot, that dipping. It doesn't help with the weight. And in a real animal, it's not really happening. The most beneficial rotation is the twisting, this one from the side. That definitely helps it feel weight or it's shifting or there's, there's um, uh, muscles uh, flexing, whatever you want. There's a lot of reasons you would want to twist it, uh, but that is definitely helpful. Still, at the end of the day, this is stuff that, especially if you're a beginner with quadrupeds, I would keep this pretty conservative. I would personally only start up with the up and down first, literally just the translation Y. Uh, later on, we'll talk about side to side because it's a bit of a subtle thing. A little bit of side maybe, and that's it. I wouldn't put any rotation. I certainly wouldn't put twist. I certainly wouldn't put side to side uh, rotations, I mean from the top view, um, I would only maybe start layering that in towards the end of my walk cycle uh, life. Like I'm ready to polish, I can lock certain things down, then I'll start introducing a little bit. Again, the main reason is, especially this is practical for CG rigs, your head will inherit stuff that you don't want. Sometimes your spine up here where there's some important shapes that happen will inherit stuff that you don't want. So I really suggest to people they keep it very simple for as long as they can and then only flesh it out once most of the walk is feeling good. Um, the other kind of thing to point out for the chest is sort of how to deal with the bulging left and right. The general rule is pretty similar to a lot of more 2D approaches, oh, excuse me, which is, you know, when the right leg is forward, you sort of can draw this line of axis through the shoulders, through the scapulas, it'll bulge out towards that extended arm. And then as this comes back, it'll bulge out towards this extended arm. Again, if you can look at the real example, this is pretty subtle you'll definitely see this edge moving that way. Some of that is the side to side, but some of it is the bulging. So don't overdo this too much. It definitely adds to your quadruped walk cycle to not ignore this, but some people kind of overdo it and it starts to look really wonky. So just be conservative with it. In general, don't put too much rotation in the chest. The most beneficial one is the twisting left and right. Um, Definitely not this axis and definitely not the dipping. The dipping is the worst of all. I've had so many problems in my career because of that. Um, and that's it. And just try to be conservative in general with your chest animation. Really rely on your scapulas and your legs to do a lot of the motion. We'll move on to the next one. All right. In this section, we're going to talk about the front legs for a quadruped walk cycle. As I mentioned before, the scapula and the arms aren't physically connected by bone to the body of the animal. It's really just held together by uh, meat and, and muscles and other stuff. So it allows for a bigger range of motion and it allows for great suspension when landing and other types of activities. Um, and when you're doing a walk cycle, you really wanna wanna rely on the movement of your scapula and your legs a lot more than the movement of your chest. Um, there are two major landmarks to worry about. 
The first one is what I call the scapula pop. I think everybody does. It's very apparent on cats. Um, it's less noticeable in other animals like cows and horses, but it's still there. And it's one of those things that I think if you feel like it's missing a little bit of weight, it's okay to embellish it a little bit if it's appropriate, um, even for the animals where you're not noticing it as much. Um, and hopefully the skinning too, some scapulas will be simmed later with a muscle simulation. And so that'll really show up properly, but certain productions, they don't have that budget. And so the skinning is a little problematic for the scapula. That's an important thing as an animator to give feedback on if you have that opportunity. Um, because it will hurt. You'll do everything right, but you won't be getting the visual feedback you need. So you do want to see some kind of scapular articulation under the skin if you're dealing with quadrupeds. It doesn't matter if it's cheated or simmed. As long as you can get that, that's an important point to kind of um, discuss with your teams. Um, the moment that matters the most for the weight, one of them anyway, is the moment very similar to the back legs when the front foot's about to plant. As soon as it plants, Right there, the chest needs to sink down for just a couple of frames before it can lift. The other moment is that the scapula has to pop up while that's sinking down. If you kind of play this a few times, boom, boom. That movement, that movement is really important. Chest down, scapula pops up. When quadrupeds are walking, they don't really it depends on the size of the animal, of course. Some animals are a little different. But in general, they'll start to straighten their leg out as they approach. And then once they plant, they'll stiffen up their legs, their front leg, excuse me. And that's what will take the weight. It's not the same as the back. You'll see a lot more compression there. The front legs will tend to stiffen up and the scapula will take all the weight and the body will sink down into that. It's sort of like they're temporarily turning into stilts. Their legs, 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 then stiff stilts. And you'll see that this relationship here doesn't change too much. Again, there's exceptions everywhere in the animal kingdom, but as a general rule to think about, this is kind of the way they act. And it stays pretty stiff until the scapula releases the weight, then it shifts over, and then it comes back into an articulating leg. That's a pretty important feature. That scapula pop and this idea of stiffness, right? Um, another thing that will happen that can sometimes help with the weight, if your rig has this ability, is from a front view, the scapulas can actually spread out to allow space for the chest to fall into that, that cavity, right? So they'll open up and close and open up and close to make room for the chest to sink in. That opening up, like actually translating the scapulas away from the body, that is super helpful if you have that in your rig. Again, I would keep it very subtle. You don't want to go too crazy with this, but a little bit of that is pretty good. Um, the next major feature that I think is pretty important is the hot compression. In the back leg, the hot compression is affecting everything uh, in the sense that everything feels like it's collapsing and everything is, is sort of uh, compressing a bit. For the front legs, this in conjunction with that stiff leg and the scapula pop is what makes it feel weighty. So what you'll see here is as it lands, this will open up and it'll, it'll sink down a little bit. This combined again with the scapula popping makes it feel like it just took a lot of weight. It has tension and it's supporting itself. This is really apparent in horses, uh, sometimes dogs. It's a little more subtle in other animals. The reason I got this video of the cheetah is because he's stepping on a rock. So it's much more noticeable. In kind of regular steps, it's a little more subtle right here. But it's still there. Under the skin, you know, with your rig, you still want to put that in there. And if you can nail these two with that going up and the splay, which we'll talk about in another section, you're golden. You're in a really good place. Um, so yeah, that's enough about the legs for now. We'll move on to the next section. In this video, I'm gonna go over the head a little bit and talk about a couple of subtleties with it. Uh, the head isn't too involved in a quadruped walk cycle. It's really heavy and it acts as a, counter, a counterbalance in a lot of other movements, uh, especially runs, jumps, and other kinds of activities. But in a walk cycle, it is pretty easy to observe. It's held pretty still. It really is just reacting to impacts and the kind of weight. So you would really want to connect it to the up and down of the chest. As the chest rises, it dips down. As the chest sinks, it drags a little bit, then it takes the weight and bumps. Some animals have more pronounced motion, cows and horses. There's a lot of different reasons I've been kind of uh, told and discovered over my career on why this happens. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's really just kind of looking at it um, and trying to observe the subtlety there and never keep it too clean. That's the main thing I would want to say about a head. People tend to look at the eyes, regardless of if you're doing, unless you're doing extreme cartoon, but even most cartoon, 
and definitely VFX and realistic. A head that is too simple will feel a little bit off. There is a lot of complexity to the head motion, the bobbing and the bumping and all this stuff. And so the more you can observe, the better. And maybe that might inspire some details you'd want to put in your animation. But in general, keeping a head too simple, you have all this realistic motion in the body, but keeping a head too simple, it's just, it's always going to kind of give away the secret and, and, and take away from the animation a little bit. Um, let's look at this guy from the front view. Here's a leopard walking along. There's a couple of pivots I consider when I'm dealing with the head. Again, it's such a huge mass. Um, there's this pivot here, let's say, where the head connects, sorry, where the neck connects to the body. That's the base of the neck. And the other one's at the base of the head, where it connects to the, to the neck. These two pivots contribute differently to its motion. The base of the neck will, and I'm thinking about this in the terms of a CG rig, will contribute to its basic translation through space, up and down, left and right. A lot of that is inherited from the base of the neck and the swaying of the neck. Um, there's a lot of different styles, but in this style we can observe that as he steps, the neck swings over the leg that took the weight. And then he steps with his right, and it'll now swing over the right. Steps with his left, it'll swing over the left. That's the first major one. And from profile, it's doing with the other animals. As the chest lifts, it, drag, it dips down because it took some weight. As the chest is falling, it drags back. Um, those are the two major motions. Now, again, some animals, it'll lead away from the foot that you stepped. It's sometimes it's just offset a little bit in the cycle. And so it's kind of overlapping a bit more. It's really difficult to give you a solid rule, but that's the beginnings of it. I tend to favor swinging over the leg that just took the weight, uh, because it is such a heavy, a heavy piece of the animal. Uh, the next thing to kind of think about is the subtlety here. I find a lot of people really nail the profile, this is the easiest because we tend to start our walk cycles from the profile anyway. Um, and so the dipping down and the sort of little bumps are usually pretty well nailed. You don't want to always keep those super subtle, uh, sorry, super simple either. Sometimes there can be complexity to that. That could be very interesting. The head could have a double bounce. Uh, the head could have just a weird timing to the bounce. It feels a little delayed. It feels a little soon. There's a lot of subtlety you could pick out of your animations. And so it's worth trying to observe and incorporate that and see what inspires you, right? Sometimes you can even um, have a bit more leeway. The, um, the axis that I find gets ignored the most, I'm gonna open up this one, is this axis, the twisting. This one gets uh, the side to side nose, that also gets not ignored, but not done correctly. So I'll go through both of them very briefly. The nose swinging left and right, it absolutely happens, but I find a lot of animators tend to go overboard in their cycle. So if you have a cycle where the nose is drifting too far left and too far right, it just feels unfocused, especially predators. Predators have very stable heads. In general, their eyes tend to stay parallel to the ground when they're moving. doesn't matter what they're doing. They tend to stay parallel um, because they're focused on a target, right? Uh, and you'll notice herbivores, like I noticed with the cows before, they have a lot more range of motion sometimes. Um, but this left and right turning sometimes tends to get overdone because animators want to feel a little bit more in the head. And I don't feel that's the way you need to bring in more life into your head. Absolutely put it in there. There's little sort of moments where that could definitely be appropriate. I find what's underused and needs to be put in more is this tilting. Um, this tilting adds a lot of free weight. It adds a lot of impact, a lot, adds a lot of complexity, which really happens. So as he swings over his right leg, I got there a subtle tilt. He sort of tilted away. He sort of dragged a little bit towards where he's heading. Then he sort of straightens out. And as he swings over there, there's a little bump down and a bump up in this axis. Um, it totally adds a lot of value to it. I think it's, totally, it's uh, difficult to understand sometimes when people are looking at the reference. I tend to look at the eye height to see if the eyes are the same height, you know, parallel to the ground. That gives me a sense of if the head is neutral or if this eye is lower that eye's higher than the head is tilted. Uh, but sometimes you might not get a good angle on the eyes. Um, you might be more profile. And so the other thing I look at is the tips of the ears. I try to see the height of the ears. Here I can clearly tell that, oops, this ear is a little lower than that ear. So he's likely tilted this way, even if it's not super apparent in the eyes, which it actually is. Um, that's another good indicator of trying to understand the tilt. And the idea is not to replicate it perfectly if it's not appropriate for your shot, but it's to look at all three axes of head rotation in any reference you find, including unrelated references. You could start a walk cycle with a main reference, and then I tend to have little small references for details, foot swing, foot plant, 
Depends on what I want to put in there. Uh, but look at all three axes of motion. Try to understand what it's doing and see what little uh, tidbits you can pull out and put into your animation. It'll really help it feel fleshed out. Because like I said at the beginning, a simple head really hurts a very realistic animation. It needs that little bit of fuzz, a little bit of complexity to be pretty cool. In this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about side to side animation. Side to side animation left and right as they shift from leg to leg is really important in walk cycles. It really helps to sell the weight. It becomes less important as you start getting all the way to the fastest gate, the gallop. In a gallop, you absolutely want to have a little bit of side to side, but if you put too much, it starts to make the animal feel inefficient and off balance a little bit. Um, and in real life, they, they're much more streamlined than that. Um, my philosophy on side to side is to keep it tight and subtle. I don't find it looks good for something this size, let's say, like a regular sized animal, not some fantastical creature, to have too much left and right, period. The amplitude should be reduced, but also to have it too floaty, where it's kind of evenly going to the left and evenly going to the right. I focus on the moments of impacts. I want to make that moment where it takes the weight on the leg and it shifts over. I want that to be read. I want that to be seen or felt. And the sort of shifting back over to the other one could be a lot more subtle. It could be disguised a little bit in the movement. I hope that makes sense. Um, the moments I focus on are here. Like I would say that this here, the animal feels a little more balanced and it's starting to shift over. So like, if you track this dot, you can clearly see it's shifting over. And that's a little more subtle. But this moment when it impacts and then it shifts over that leg, that's a lot more pronounced to me. It's sort of a moment that I would read as an audience member. And so the shift over can be subtle, but the impact moments, that's when I would put the emphasis on the side to side. So to recap, I would keep them subtle so the amplitude isn't too big. And I would really restrict it to these little moments of the impact. That's when I feel you get the most bang for your buck. And, and the rest of it, the rest of the time in the walk, you don't have to feel it so much. This applies to the front and the back. Um, I wouldn't say the back for some animals, just like the up and down, the amplitude is a little bigger. Some animals, the side to side is a little bigger in the back, but I find that is disguised a lot by the rotation. So it's not as big a deal, but it's just something to keep in mind. Hope that helps. Uh, now we'll talk about a couple of subtleties, uh, for animating the legs, uh, a couple of refinement tips. Uh, the first major one is the spacing from a profile. When an animal is walking, and it becomes much more apparent when they're running at the faster gates. But what we're all basically doing, including humans, is we're swinging our leg forward. And then when we're about to land, we swing our legs back so that when they do swing back, they match the speed of the ground. And again, this becomes very apparent in a run cycle where it swings way past and then it swings way back for, for the contact. Now, when it's a walk, it's a lot subtler. And so that turns into sort of a stomp down. It doesn't really swing back as much in most animals. And I think that's pretty important for the spacing. You know, the common rule in anim is it peels here and it plants there. And so most motions, you'll want to have a little bit of ease frame. So it's, it's grouping up and it groups a little bit when it's about to stop and it's faster in the middle. That's kind of a common thing in anim. It definitely applies, but I think this is a really important moment that separates okay walk cycles and great walk cycles. It's this little moment where if you track the foot, as it's landing, this is the moment I'm talking about, it slows down its forward progression. And it actually sort of slows down a lot. And it sort of stomps down the last frame. That's really important. You don't want it progressing forward to the ground. You want it reaching its, its peak and then slamming straight down, sort of. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's the first subtlety that I think is pretty important. And it really helps to sell the weight. Um, the next one that I think is pretty important too, more for mechanics, is the way that they swing out and in from the front view. The animals do this to not sort of cross and hit each other's legs, right? They don't want to hit their own legs as they're, as they're passing. So what they'll do is as they peel, they'll swing out. And then when they're about to land, they swing back in at the last moment. To me, sometimes I find it difficult with some designs to notice, to have it readable, the swing out after the peel. So I find you get more, more bang for your buck to make sure that you're reading the swinging in. The swinging in is what matters the most, in my opinion, to make it feel like a believable cycle. So when it's at its passing pose, even if it's subtle amounts, sometimes it's barely noticeable, but it's felt. You want to have the, the, hand, the legs a little bit further away from the body. And then that moment between passing to landing, it swings in and plants under the body. That moment of swinging on and swinging in is pretty important subtlety. Some animators forget it. And again, it doesn't make them believable. It makes them look a little stiff. It's really important to keep this in there. Another one, uh, especially for bigger animals, 
is elbow pops. I talked about how to show the weight in a leg by scapula popping up, chest sinking down, and hot compression. The other one which works really well is to include this, the, the elbow jiggle. It's very subtle for most animals, but it's absolutely there. The general rule is sort of like, it's sort of tucked in as it's passing, then it swings out as it's about to land, and then once it compresses and the force goes back up the leg, it jiggles in and out. This could be more apparent in some bigger animals. It'll be an actual jigger that sort of a uh, jiggle that's, that tapers off. Um, but it's pretty important. The minimum though that you want to do is the swing out on the passing and then after it compresses, swing in. This motion in combined with that compressing, combined with that popping really makes it feel like the leg tenses up and it takes some weight. It's a good little tip. Helps a lot. Uh, the last little subtlety I want to talk about, and I'll zoom into this little example, is a clever way to deal with uh, foot splay. Again, it's a little different per animal, uh, but the general idea is the same, even for hooved animals, but they do have a lot less articulation than, a, than an animal's, than a, a didigigrade or a plantigrade. I was originally taught when I was growing up in animation that you sort of key your toes together, and then when they plant, you key again, and then a few frames later, you let them spread. That's basically right, but there's a little bit of a subtlety there that I think also separates good cycles from great cycles, which is the animals actually starts to spread its toes in anticipation of landing. So it starts to open up right before the impact. And I find that king it that way just adds a little bit sharpness, a little bit something a little bit nicer. This is especially geared towards uh, realistic animation. Um, you have a lot of leeway with cartoony and other stuff, but again, I'm more of a VFX background. This is kind of more of the things I think about. So as it's landing, if I kind of look at this pose, I can tell that they're tucked in. I can see the spaces here are pretty compressed. And right away, I'll see the frame right before contact, it's splayed out a little bit. It's not just rotating, it feels like it splays out. And then the impact frame, there's a much bigger splay. So I would almost consider closed, sort of an ease frame. And then you want a, a big difference between right before it contacts and it impacts. It's right on the impact frame that you want to see a big spread, not after. I think a lot of people get taught that incorrectly, and so it's something I want to point out, only because I've seen it uh, in my career that it could be a little better. And then after that, a few more frames, it can continue to splay or spread, or it depends on the animal. They'll have a jiggle or rebound. There's a lot of styles beyond that point. But to me, the important moment is right before contact, it's more closed, and on the frame of contact, it pops open, and then it continues to ease out. That's the important tip there. In this video, I'm going to have a very simple tip for the chest and hip animation. Um, really pay attention to the spacing, especially with the Y, the up and down. It rarely moves. This actually applies to pretty much all realistic animation. Nothing really moves through space in a very clean way, usually. There's always a little bit of subtlety, a little bit of irregularity, and it becomes really important in quadruped animation to, at some point, earlier in the animation process than later to really nail down your hips and chest animation, or at least as close as you can, right? You'll always be able to keep polishing and polishing. Um, what I tend to do is I do my first pass on my chest and my hips, then I do my legs. And what you'll often notice is then you'll, you'll realize that your chest or your hips are not really quite nailed. So you'll want to fix them. Uh, but that will mess up some of the work you did with your legs sometimes. So then you'll readjust your legs so that it all works again. And then something else will come up. Your chest animation is to change a bit, or it's not great, or your hips, you realize, oh, I forgot this. And when you change that, then it messes up your legs again. And it turns into this little loop of fix the chest, fix the legs, fix the chest, fix the legs. But at the end of the day, especially in CG animation, the legs really inherit a lot of their problems from the chest and the hips. So I find it's important to, at some point, go back in there and don't be afraid to add a bunch of keys. I mean, you work the way you want, but just try to get a little more granular with the chest and the hips. Try to get them nailed at some point in your process earlier on so that they're pretty close, you feel comfortable with them, and then you can polish the feet. Um, a lot of problems I notice in the reviews I do for quadruped animation is that people didn't really work out the chest or hips correctly. They're dealing with problems with like elbow pops or the scapula feels irregular. Something's not working in the bottom part of the animal. And it's because at that moment, the chest wasn't at the right height or the hips weren't at the right rotation. Um, so that's why I find it very important to start a, a holistic pass, do it all. But then when you, before you really start polishing, I would really focus on the chest looking as good as it can and the hips looking as good as they can before you go back into the rest of the animal. Um, 
never and avoid at all costs, especially in realistic animation, clean, even spacing, clean curves. They don't do that. They go up at a regular rate. Sometimes they hang out a little longer than you thought. Sometimes they bounce a little harder than you would have imagined. It's really important to take a good look at those with your references uh, before you move on. Thank <laughs> you.